Go ahead and give you control. All right, give me one second here. So there's there's one case I'm going to save for when David gets here because it's the most interesting case I've seen in a while. This is one where it's pretty straightforward, but it's one of these these management ones where I think people can potentially get tripped up. And this is a 31 year old man who presented with cough and fever. You can see on the PA radiograph that he there's something in the left lower lobe. There's loss of the left hemidiaphragm. It's just a little too dense here. And you look on the lateral view, you can see there's a little bit of elevation of the left hemidiaphragm and you've got this consolidation extending from the left hilum inferiorly. Now this, you know, I don't know what's going on right here. You know, it's not really a discrete mass. You can see there's the left main upper lobe continuum under the left pulmonary artery that looks reasonable there. So that was, you know, this was, he's 31. So the chance of him having anything bad is not that high. Uh, and he gets this radiograph a month later, things look better. You can see that the left lower lobe is improved. You know, you still wonder, is there something right here? I'm not gonna fault anyone for not saying that, but I think one of these images, this is four months later when you really have to raise the question, is there an obstructing endobronchial lesion? Now he's got recurrent left lower lobe pneumonia. And I think young patients with recurrent pneumonias in the same place you know, raises the possibility either it's aspiration or they've got an obstructing endobronchial lesion. So it looks very similar to that prior one. And you know, he got a follow-up a month later, still hadn't gone away. It was at that point that they got the CT. And you'll see, no surprise, that there is something cutting off the basal segmental bronchi of the left lower lobe here. And so all of this is a post-obstructive pneumonia. This is, is outside CT. It's kind of sharp window kernel. So you can, it's hard to tell what the enhancement is. but. In somebody of this age, the most likely thing you're thinking about other than a foreign body would be a carcinoid tumor. And this did turn out to be a typical carcinoid, a typical carcinoid tumor when they took it out. So I think that these are the ones that always make all of us nervous when you see the recurrent pneumonias in the same place, especially in a young patient. I think the only one, Jeff, I'm curious, and I don't know who else popped on here in the last couple of minutes, but if anyone, you know, what you think about David or Jeff, like probably is something right there, you know, more discreet than we normally see. But since it's hard to discern the basal or segmental bronchi and the lateral, you know, yeah, I think don't know. really, really hard given there's still kind of residua from his inf original infection. Yeah. But, you know, I think the, the clue is just the recurrent infections in the same place should always prompt. Yeah. Is that a little bit of, oh, no, never mind. We're just getting fooled by the spine. I was wondering if there's a little bit of bronchiectasis down there. I think there. I think some of this might be. Yeah. Yeah. You know, some some in this area, because I, I think that's the area that's involved. Involved, and then it's probably some incomplete occlusion and ball valve mechanism where he just gets recurrent pneumonias because he can't clear secretions down there. Okay. Now this one. Let me see. Oh, this is a crazy case. I've never seen. I've never seen this manifestation. This is, um, I've got a few different CTs and I just saw this last, a couple of weeks ago. We don't have a confirmed diagnosis yet, but one of my, credit to one of my residents looking at the most recent CT that for picking this up, you see this looks like a pleural plaque or some sort of pleural calcification along the, the mediastinal pleural surface in this patient. She's young and you see the port catheter right here. So that's the first study. She's had several CT since then. I'm showing them in order. None of the, these were detected. And you can see that thing is still there, maybe a little bit bigger. You know, a pleural plaque in a 23-year-old would be pretty unusual. You can see that there too. And I can just jump to the most recent study, which was this one. And notice now how these things are getting bigger. And there's this one right here. And there's some other ones, the more you look, I think this is probably medial pleural reflection anteriorly, could conceivably be pericardium, but I doubt it. This one's getting a little bit bigger anteriorly. So you wanna take a stab at what you think this is? Does she have osteosarcoma? 
that's exactly what these are, are, are like plaque-like pleural metastases from osteosarcoma. It's, it, was, it was of her jaw originally, and so she underwent, she underwent resection and radiation, and this initial, and most of these were outside studies, but this initial one was at the time of the, the diagnosis. So she already had a metastasis, although they didn't know it at that time. But yeah, I've never seen them. I mean, certainly we've all seen plural metastases and, and that's a risk factor or lung metastases along the plural. That's a risk factor for spontaneous pneumothorax. But, and I wonder if there's like, you can see right here, probably even a microscopic one you know, that's now, they've just disseminated throughout the plural space. Have you seen it look like this before, Jeff? Because this is just no. The two cases I've seen were more like it was like it looks more like a mesothelioma where you, you get a rind of bone. Yeah, but I've never seen discrete implants. Um, yeah, like that, and you can see how that's grown. So, I just thought this was a crazy manifestation of yeah. it. But, wow. Yeah. So, and of course, these are yeah would be as you said, Jeff. These would be ossified, not calcified. You know, plural plaque-like metastases. So, and finally, David, here's, I was waiting for you. This is one of, one of the most interesting cases I think I've ever seen. And it's something none of us had ever heard about, but this lady, you know, she's 37 and over the course of five years, went from being healthy to being completely bedridden and you can see she presented with a fracture of her femur. She also has linear fractures of varying ages of her, of her pelvis and of her shoulder. Uh, let's see, her, her scapula right here. And these are all non-traumatic fractures. And I can show you a whole host of other ones that she has. But this, she went through some, you know, multiple, multiple different hospitals, referrals, diagnoses of, of she was found to be hypophosphatemic, but they didn't know why. And so they eventually did a CT scan. And you can see she has these rib, rib fractures, her left scapula, you know, several segmental fractures of, of almost every bone in her body. And so she's gone from being per perfectly healthy to bed bound over the course of a few years. And so my colleague saw this and we didn't know the history at the time. And you see this tumor here what looks like a big tumor in the posterior mediastinum or paravertebral space. So what do you guys think this is? Ba based on the imaging alone, what would you say? Probably a paraganglioma. That's ex yeah, that's exactly what we, th what we thought. Yeah. And yeah, no, certainly it's hypervascular. Something else, maybe a Castleman's disease. I mean, yes, we, we had a, I, I can't remember if it was a week you were gone, but I think Seth showed a monster of a paraganglioma. So we had a long discussion yeah. about these hypervascular masses. So, so looking at this just in isolation, certainly you'd think paraganglioma may be, you know, even you know, if you're not worried about a mass, maybe some weird hem hypervascular like hemangioma or some vascular malformation. And that was kind of, and, and Castleman's disease came up and that was kind of how it was going to be signed off. And then we had a discussion in the reading room. It's like, well, we looked up her history and with all these fractures, we looked up that she had hypophosphatemia. And so we did a quick search, you know, for, for, perineoplastic syndromes. And we came across an entity called a phosphaturic mesenchymal tumor and threw that in the differential diagnosis, you know, thinking maybe, you know, this is an unusual enough tumor that it, with an unusual enough presentation, maybe this was the cause of her, her symptoms. And maybe this was a tumor induced osteomalacia. Long story short, it took them a while. They did a they did venous sampling via IR of some of these veins here, and they found that this was excreting this FGF23, which is something that does induce uh, that does induce hypophosphatemia. And so they went to surgery. Eventually, took this out after doing an embolization because it looked vascular, and they did find that this was what they thought was most likely this phosphaturic mesenchymal tumor. So it's not that it's like to keep this in the differential, I think it's more just a learning point that whenever you see a very unusual presentation, like rib fractures and fractures of every bone that's atraumatic plus an unusual looking tumor, you know, Dr. Google often has the, uh, the answer, which is what it turned out to be in this case. Well, 
So yeah, so it's a, these are rare mesenchymal tumors. They result in this hypophosphatemic osteomalacia, this overproduction of the FGF23, which is what they found in this case. So there's not really much literature in the radiology. This is one that I found with a couple of case reports. Some of these are small tumors that you know, may be in the extremities as they were in this case. They are described as being hypervascular in a lot of cases. So it's more just you know, an interesting perineoplastic syndrome when we weren't expecting it to find it that way. But yeah, this was a pretty crazy case. Amazing. So that's uh, that's it for me for now, Jeff. So did her, um, after the resection, did her uh, calcium and phosphate and all that stuff normalize? Yes, it did. And in fact, she ended up with what they're terming now as hungry bone syndrome. <laughs> what because that? now that she has, now her, her bones are so hungry for the calcium and phosphate that she has, you know, still has reduced serum levels and has to have supplementation to restore her normal bone mineralization. Wow. Yeah, but I was, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I saw that in the, in the endocrinologist note, the term hungry bone syndrome. I thought that was pretty cool. That is pretty cool. So Travis, she has to have a supplementation of calcium and phosphate then? I, I guess so, yeah. She's getting supplements of, of minerals now. She's, been, she's in a rehab facility. Wow. Wow, impressive. All right, I'll stop there. All right, David, do you have cases? Um, I haven't had any times, Jeff, sorry. That's all right, I can show a few. All righty, let's see. Well, well, I'm glad you two are on because I wanted to see what you guys think. I'll start with a straightforward case, and this is a companion case to one of the ones David has shown in the past. So um, this is a young, person who presented to our ED with chest pain. And you don't see my images yet, hold on, there we go. And you can see there's a mass in the apex, there's a mass in the left lower lobe, there may be some other mass-like areas on the radiograph. I think I have a lateral projection here somewhere, if it'll show, oh, there we go. Uh, no effusion, uh, I don't see any lymph node enlargement. And so we gave the differential for multiple things. You know, with the history we got, we questioned infection. We said neoplasm less likely. I think we mentioned vasculitis. So he had a slightly elevated creatinine. So instead of doing a CT angio, never mind. I mean, we have a good explanation for his symptoms. They wanted to rule out PE, and um, so they did a pulmonary MR angiogram, and I'll show you that. And uh, what we're going to be interested in is the lungs. And you can see there is indeed one of these peripherally enhancing mass-like areas. And there's the one on the apex here. You can see they have not terribly thick walls. Um, on the, let's see if I have some, on the localizers, let's see, this is, yeah, there we go. Let's see if I can get the scroll just right. No, it's misbehaving on me. Um, anyway, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're showing central necrosis. Here's the earlier phase MR sequence here. Just, there we go. Um, you can see the, um, the early enhancement along the wall there. So they're pretty necrotic. So at this point, um, you know, we did question uh, GPA. And I'll, let me see if I can find the right one. Here's the, the layer, lower one. You also notice there's some, looks like maybe some thickening of the bronchus, but especially this right upper lobe bronchus, but really hard to see on the MR, uh, the extent of that. So they ended up doing a CT the, the next day. I'm not sure. Uh, what it adds, but it does show the airway disease to advantage. And you can see there is um, some narrowing in the subglottic trachea. He's partially expiratory. And then as we go down, we'll see some narrowing. I'll come back to the lungs. There's some wall thickening at the lower trachea. And then there's also some narrowing at the crying a little bit, a little bit of regularity there. So uh, good fit for GPA with areas of uh, sort of mass-like consolidation, cavitation, Really no pleural effusion, no lymphadenopathy, which goes along with that diagnosis and a couple other areas too. And his ankles were positive. And you can see this upper lobe bronchus is pretty tight here. So I know David has shown a case or so. It's not that common, but it's in the differential for multiple masses and, and can present at any age, but we seem to see it more in the younger patients. He was in his, well, he was at, I believe in his twenties. Okay, so this is, um, 
this is an interesting case, and it's um, interesting for a variety of reasons. So this is a patient with pulmonary fibrosis. He's a 72-year-old, and he has a variety yep. of exposure. Yep. Yeah? Yep. We got the old case. The new case has yeah, to come Yeah, still up. same one. Oh, I know. I haven't actually brought up the images yet. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to figure out which one I want to show you. Uh, here we go. Okay. Okay, so this was his scan about three years ago. And you can see he has fibrosis, some traction bronchiolectasis or minimal honeycombing, whichever camp you want to be in. Uh, it's pretty subpleural. There's a little bit of peribronchial disease, especially in the upper lobes. But as you go down, I would argue this is it's pretty modest in the basis. Um, and if I was seeing this in, without any history and without any... Um, additional information. I think I have a coronal too. Yeah, let me show you the coronal. Um, so let me see this better window level. There we go. I, I would favor this being fibrotic HP, just given the upper zone predominance without the history of knowing he had exposures. And at the time, um, you know, he was given a working diagnosis of HP based on the ex his exposure history and his upper zone predominant fibrosis. It's not the classic UIP pattern, but I could see someone maybe calling this indeterminate or even a, maybe a possible UIP, but I would argue it's not basal predominant at this point in time. I don't know, what would you guys say? Just, I haven't shown you his follow-up. That's fine. Okay, yeah, I agree. I think there looked like there was some mosaic attenuation too. It'd be interesting to see air trap or yeah. expiratory imaging, but. That was an outside scan, so we don't have it. And some of it's maybe yeah. contrast artifact. So here's his scan now. This is three years after his first scan and you can see the fibrosis has definitely worsened and um, you know maybe some honeycombing in that right upper in both upper lobes there's a couple of clusters of cysts but now you can see the lower lung disease has progressed um, and it does go all the way down to the recesses there so you know this one again without history i could maybe go both ways on it um, it's it's i think more subplural than the last one um, and I would not, I think I could go either way. And I think a lot of people could, I'm gonna make a, um, make this a little bit thicker here just to denoise it a bit, but you know, that's a tough one. I, I think it's still upper lung predominant. So I really like this yeah. for HP. Okay. Yeah. And that's kind I of what I think too. Um, and you know, with, and with a work and with a supporting clinical history too, as well. Uh, but, but, you know, this, uh, and I don't remember where this one was at, but this this was called UIP, which I it wouldn't be my first choice, but at the same time, I, I would also not necessarily fully disagree with it. This may be one that goes in that indeterminate category because it has a little bit of features of both. But you know, I've, I've seen this a couple of times where we see progressive fibrosis and the pattern sort of starts to shift a little bit or it gets harder to discern the distribution. So um, right. one of the things I like to do is go back to the older cases. I'm going to show you another case, a totally unrelated case, where having the older imaging really makes you uh, feel better about what you're, where you're going to go with it. But yeah, so yeah, and I think go ahead. This just highlights the difficulty and in the interobserver variability and the value of multidisciplinary discussion on these. Yeah, I know David and I tend to agree on a lot of these cases. That's why I, <laughs> yeah, I bring it up. But yeah, it's a tough one. Um, it's it's but it's very subplural. I wish there was more central disease. It would make me a little more confident. I mean, you got a little. Pets spot here but it's not overwhelmingly you know i always think of it hp is often sort of a balance between the peribronchial and the subplural but this is really subplural but hard to make an it's either diffuse or not quite basal predominant. yeah and you know if i just saw this study and and brett and i are pretty similar i think our approach here like we'd often say that it's slightly more upper lobe and may represent chronic hp or an atypical distribution of uip right. ipf the problem is he's the right demographic for ipf yeah. So that's what makes this challenging. But with it, with right. the exposures, uh, I don't have an issue with that. So then let me show you this one. So Jeff, how old is this guy? He was 72. 72, okay. Okay, so I'm going to show you the next one now. Hold on, I'm going to make sure I pull up the, I want to pull up the newest scan before I reveal anything. Um, okay, I'll pull it up and then share the screen with you. So I'm not going to give you the history yet. So this patient has pulmonary fibrosis as well. Now, it's having an acute exacerbation at this time. So I may show you a slightly older one. But 
let me go let me go back one time point here's the patient a few years ago so I don't think any of you would have a difficulty with this diagnosis at this point in time no there's a lot of subplural sparing exactly and there's sort of this almost nodular ground glass opacity it is basal predominant but interesting there are a few subplural cystic spaces but there's also some just isolated cystic spaces and there's a quite nice traction bronchiectasis and an abnormal esophagus. So this is a pretty typical NSIP pattern on, eight, on CT with this nice subplural sparing. So that's 2014. Uh, let's see, I think I had a more recent CT. Yeah, here we, I mean, a, more, a newer CT. So here's the patient now, uh, five years, five and a half years later. And you can see we sort of lose a lot of the subplural sparing. So you can imagine if you were presented with just this scan, depending on your level of experience and how many of these cases you've seen, um, you know, you, I could see someone maybe saying, well, this is clearly basal predominant and argue maybe it's even subplural predominant. Mm -hmm. and there's some features that suggest some honeycombing. Now, there's some things that bother me. There's a lot of lower lobe volume loss and there's a lot of traction bronchiectasis. But, you know, if someone called this a UIP or, you know, a UIP-like pattern, I, I don't see fault with that. I mean, maybe with a superimposed exacerbation or something, but you can see it's changed dramatically. Um, so this just illustrates the point that sometimes that subplural sparing disappears, and I've seen that on a few occasions now uh, as it progresses. And then at this, and then the most recent one, uh, where it was yeah, this one, there we have, and this is actually a nice one where the patient developed an acute exacerbation at this point. So you see this new patchy ground glass yeah. imposed on it. But yeah, so I guess the take home from these two cases is for, you know, especially if you don't have a lot of experience, but I find myself doing this a lot too, is I try to go back as far as possible, whether it's an abdominal CT or an older chest CT, if I'm fortunate to have it, because I find, I find my confidence can go up when I know what it looked like before there were, it was so extensive, it's hard to sort out the distribution or if there's a superimposed exacerbation kind of where it's coming from. So old films, old films make you smarter, and I think in this in this situation, that's really often the case. Yeah. So I always go to the earliest exam to see how things started, uh, because at, everything tends to converge to the same horrible looking. Right. Yeah. He's everywhere. That's a good point. Make it up. And, I, I, and then the other the other case, I, the other thing I'd emphasize about this case is there's uh, a ton of basal ground glass here and very little honeycombing. Right. So. Um, you know, for instance, in that right lung base, it's really a ground glass abnormality. Right. And there's striking lower low volume loss, which is one of the features right. um, that, that that can also help with NSIP patterns sometimes. Now, is this a scleroderma person? Or yes, a... it is a scleroderma person. Right. One of the more progressive ones, progressive right. in lung disease, not in the politics. Now, even if, even if the biopsy reveals UIP, uh, you know, you can get to UIP by having years of NSIP on the way. So, Absolutely. And, you know, and, and Nestor and his group uh, back in like 2007 or six published their paper showing that uh, long-term NSIP can also on CT evolve like UIP. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So it just takes a while to get there. Right. And we don't typically biopsy these patients because it doesn't change their management. And then there uh, are some data showing that up to 50% of patients with a CT pattern of NSIP will have histologic UIP. Okay, so this is a cool case too. This is something I don't recall seeing. Um, so this young uh, male patient is a 28-year-old um, uh, immigrant from Mexico who presented back uh, several years ago. I don't know if I have a radiograph at the time, but he presented I'll pull up the radio CT here with lungs that looked like this. And this is another pretty classic CT appearance. So presented- Hey Jeff, we're just we're just seeing the toolbar. We're not seeing yeah. the image. Let's try that. Why the toolbar would show up. Yeah. There we go. So there he showed up uh, short of breath over about five days with a CT that looks like this. And I don't think the diagnosis is a, is a, is a particular challenge for people. We've seen this before. I'm going to denoise it a bit for you. So he's got this diffuse ground glass opacity with these spared black lobules. Um, and what he was doing at the time, and here's the there are the transverse images, was working on a farm. It just started working on a farm and developed this. So this is a nice example of active hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And he was treated at the time 
were told not to go to the farm, was given a lot of steroids, and looked like this several months later. So it got all better. And we didn't hear from him again for a while. And then he presents about two years later with a radiograph that looks like this, short of breath. You can see there's just this, the vessels are ill-defined and it's hazy, suggesting ground glass opacity. And here is his CT scan from that same day and kind of looks just like he did three years earlier. Looks like HP, even the same lobules are mm -hmm. trapped in air, which I thought was really cool. I don't know why that is, but that's what happened. And turns out, um, so we, we said this is recurrent HP. Turns out he started working on another farm five days before this CT <laughs> against medical advice. So wow. I don't think I can recall seeing somebody with HP who got better than recur. I've seen people progress, not recover, be left with some fibrosis, but I've never seen it clear up and then come back. And what I really can't explain is why the same air trapping occurred. <laughs> any, any of you seen recurrent HP like this? No, not that I can remember. I wonder if those if the subsegmental airways to those lobules are, are just scarred, scarred down. And so you don't have antigen getting in there. Yeah, that would be my guess. So okay. this is one of the few cases of, uh, this is, a, this would qualify as acute HP. You know, generally when you, when we see it, it's subacute. Right. Right. And, Hello? and that's, this is sort of, a, and, the re, and that's interesting. You bring that up because um, there was a paper, Hello? that did a cluster analysis looking at these patients and really there's two hello hello who's, there's oh, no. <laughs> uh, there's two real clusters of patients there's sort of the the active hp and the uh fibrotic and there's really no true acute subacute and chronic um patterns as far as clinical phenotypes. So this is what I like to call, and I like their terminology, active HP, where there's active inflammation, uh, a lot of inflammatory cells, in contrast to our, our patients who may be removed from their environment but still have fibrosis in their lungs that may or may not. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. I, I do think David's point, though, I mean, this sounds like he has two definable exposures. Absolutely. Whereas a lot of patients with subacute to chronic HP have more continuous low level exposure. True. And they do make that, that comment that it may be two, 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 manifest, two pathophysiologies leading to the same in, uh, endpoint where you know, these sort of fibrotic HPs that show up with dyspnea progressing over two years and had a bird for 20 years versus right. him where he shows up on the farm and gets sick. There were cattle, there was hay, and who knows what else. So it's hard to uh, to know what, where the engine was. I'm guessing it's just the collective farm dusts. But it's interesting because there's been a shortage of farm hands, um, partially because some of the uh, the aggressive immigration type um, things going on in the country, that it's pretty lucrative business uh, uh, for um, people to come work on farms, especially our dairy farms where they need, they need help. And uh, so I think that, I don't know for certain, but if that played in why he, he returned to the farm, even though he'd been told he can't go back. Yeah. So Jeff, this was a cattle, a cattle uh, dairy farm. That... It's a dairy farm. So it's presumably the hay is my guess. So that's supposed to be, uh, so, you know, the, uh, it's supposed to be thermophilic actinomyces and so-called moldy hay. Yeah. So Although it's, yeah. We had a wet June, so it's possible, but there's so many dusts on farms. That's why we call it farmer's lung, because there's so many different things. There's If they've got greenhouses, there's aspergillus, there's poultry sometimes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, and the uh, barns are notoriously dusty and stuff just kind of accumulates there. And if you're tossing, moving stuff a lot, you're kicking up a lot of dust. And if you're around the cows, it's probably not the cows, but cows kick up a lot of dust. Yeah. Yeah. You're more... <clears throat> So here's another cool case. So this is a follow-up of Howard's cases. And um, I don't know if you guys saw in the news, but in uh, recently in Milwaukee, they reported eight teenagers who developed acute lung injury related to vaping, all in a very short period of time. So the state health department's been investigating. We don't, we're trying to get in touch with those pediatric folks in, at the Children's Hospital of Wisconsin to see 
uh, we're curious about the imaging, but um, we don't know anything about them, the patients or anything. But this was a young patient that presented to one of our hospitals, 19 years old, presented short of breath and had this radiograph. And you can see there's just bilateral lung consolidation, no effusion, no lymphadenopathy. So it could be a lot of things, hemorrhage, non-cardiogenic edema, infection. Um, and so they did a CT scan on him. Let's see if you, there we go. And it shows what you imagine from the radiograph, uh, pretty extensive ground glass opacity, but you'll see it sort of has an organizing pneumonia-like look to it. Um, it's got some spared lobules, sort of some arcading out in the periphery. It's very peribronchial, uh, no, uh, no effusion to get excited about or anything like that. Um, and the only thing in his history is he was vaping uh, cannabis. So um, I was I was recently in Chicago and I and you know in Illinois they've decriminalized marijuana. I don't know when the laws changed exactly, but uh, there was a guy I, I saw two people in the course of a week of vaping and clearly smelled like marijuana, just hanging around. So yeah. it's not just tobacco stuff, but also people. there was a little bit of septal thickening. Could this be another acutest eosinophilic pneumonia from it? it? Did be, they give him steroids or did he have eosinophils? They, not peripherally that we know of, they, they, uh, they, they just blasted him with steroids and he got better. So yes, possibly. I know when Howard showed his cases, one had an acute eosinophilic pneumonia, yeah. one didn't. And for me, the imaging overlaps significantly, although you do mention uh, the septal lines. He doesn't have a ton of them. The ones no, there's, that, yeah, no, I agree. There's only a couple. I, I agree. There's so much overlap and it doesn't really matter necessarily right. since the you know which is tied to the exposure yeah. the ones i've seen with acute eosinophilic pneumonia are often very sick uh many in the icu mechanical ventilation and they're better within like 24 hours of corticosteroid he took a little bit more time so he may have been a bland organizing pneumonia but my guess is we're going to start seeing more of these and i don't know how many of these are going unrecognized or called you know called community acquired pneumonia and they're pneumonia. getting antibiotics and they're not vaping and so it goes away on its own. But you know, clearly amongst us, we've seen a few cases. And now with this cluster in Milwaukee, we wondered, and I, it's unclear, that's why the health department's investigating whether it's a specific vape juice, uh, if there was any relationship. It's None of it's been released, so nobody knows if these children were um, teenagers were even, like if they knew each other, if it just happened to be, people are starting to recognize it. But as, as, as the vaping increases, and there was actually just a, I think it was in chest, there was a um, abstract or paper that looked at uh, airway injury and airway inflammation in vape juice. And it kind of makes sense for inhaling all these volatile compounds, but that it's causing maybe mucosal injuries. And if severe enough or in the right place and the right person triggers a more extensive acute lung injury. Now, it, Jeff, is the, um, is the eosinophilia attributed to the vaping um, milieu or is it to the to the marijuana what so travis brought up the affiliate what what's the uh what, what is that attached to it's usually not just uh marijuana i mean most of the cases have been described in tobacco smoke young smokers there was a series uh, in jama back in 2006 that looked at U.S. service personnel. There were about 16 or 14 patients with eosinophilic lung disease, and all of them were smokers. I think all but one or two of them had just started smoking. So in the right patient with the right immunology or you know, biology, uh, something in smoke, there, there could be aspergillus or something in tobacco yeah. as well as marijuana. I know we've seen plenty of marijuana and as aspergillus relationship uh, with mm -hmm. some of the Chronic lung, chronically ill patients who are somewhat immune suppressed, uh, and this could be sort of a hyperimmune response to whatever antigen. But now that we're seeing it in vaping juice, which is often oils and other who knows what compounds, uh, and in this case cannabis, sometimes it's just like it's a nicotine oil. Uh, but whatever it is, it's injuring the lungs, and because the lung only responds so many ways, some people are getting an organizing injury. Uh, there was one of the one of the Milwaukee cases reportedly was still in the hospital, so maybe more of a DAD type. But again, I don't have any details. But uh, if I, get no, I, heard, I, heard that, I heard that one of the flavoring agents they use in vaping products, especially for kids, is diacetyl. So we might be seeing some uh, popcorn right. lung. Yeah, yeah, popcorn again. 
in yeah there was, yeah, I, there was one one paper that commented they 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 analyzed i think 160 different vape juices and found a fair amount of diacetyl and i mean who knows what else is in this stuff because it's all flavored and yeah. uh, scented and you, know, you just got all these crazy compounds but you know with with more and more legal cannabis and increasing vaping and, and maybe the aerosolization of it also yeah changes how it, where it goes in the lung i found a recent case report acute eosinophilic pneumonia vaping and they're saying that the the e-cigarettes are vaping induces similar cytokine release to tobaccos to cigarette smokers elevated il6 il8 mm -hmm. so yeah who knows what the exact so the exact compound is in there but so that's one of my new questions when I see acute lung injury and one of the clinicians come down. I, you know, I used to always ask them, you know, exposures, but I specifically ask about vaping now yeah. or marijuana. Um, you know, especially with our next door neighbor, uh, Illinois, making it legal, we're going to see more recreational marijuana probably in our neck of the woods. So um, that's just one of my standard questions now because, um, you know, especially if it's a non-pulmonary person like a general hospitalist or something, they may not be aware of this because it's such an uncommon thing. Yep. Okay. Well, that that's all I have this week. All right. Short yeah. conference, I guess. Yeah. Sounds good. See you guys next week. Yeah. Take Jeff, care. Before yeah. you hang up, whatever happened with that project that Ver